दर्शन के लिए ये शायद उसकी यस yes, है yes, <laughs> President of Dehradun Society, the energetic, enthusiastic, and ever courteous Dr. Manisha Singh, and through her, the entire family of Dehradun OG Society members, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. and honoring me by inviting me to conduct this cme solo cme the responsibility in solo cme is very big because you are the only speaker only teacher only faculty and nobody is there to cover you up also by any reason if you can't reach that destination because of so many variations then the entire program goes fat thank god i'm here in this dev bhumi and very happy to share with you whatever i can let us start the topic for the day is very practical very routineous but still it has the capacity to completely metamorphose you in the labor room that is the beauty of science we continuously evaluate ourselves as to how right are we how wrong are we in the light of new developments and new understandings in our science and that makes our teachers job more challenging because if we are going to discuss with you the same old things then why should are we required our lectures our talks and everything becomes drab like this boring but with the infusion of new developments and bringing them into this subject infuses life in your lives as well as in the presentation let us start with initiation of labor this is not just a didactical lecture actually it is two way exchange of ideas and what i stand i take i will be backing it up continuously with as much latest references good quality references as possible more than a month hard work has gone in this lecture preparation and therefore i would like you to take maximum possible advantage of it let us see what is new and what is path changing that has come in initiation of labor in recent days first i will ask you a question then you keep thinking and then i will give you the answer based on scientific facts in the light of current thinking following a series of articles in last few years indicating futility and even downright harm in waiting for up to 41 weeks you decide to revisit the policy we know that nearly no obstetrician now waits for up to 41 weeks the biggest objection in your conscience always is early induction will increase cesarean section rate what do you feel keep thinking a very famous epidemiologist hans rosling says that in case of doubt always fall back upon data now let us see what data has to tell us A 2018 article: 3,062 women were assigned to labor induction, and 3,044 were assigned to expectant management, and let the labor begin on its own. Let us see what happened. 
Induction of labor at 39 weeks. I repeat, induction of labor at 39 weeks in lower risk subjects, lower risk nulliparous women did not result in adverse perinatal outcome, but it did result in a significantly lower frequency of cesarean section. So what is the message? Induce labor at 39 weeks, do not wait till 40. Data tells, I am not telling you. Now we come to one very interesting situation still prevalent. There are many old timers who still prefer Polly's catheter for mechanical dilatation of cervix and induction of labor. Their argument is trying to use something as little injurious as possible. How good is the old method in modern times? You would also like to think. You may not be using it. Some of you may be using it. Let us see how good is this old method. It is like this great actor who was so popular in his younger days. Is he still relevant today? Let us see. Data of 2023 latest data shows a low to moderate quality evidence has shown that mechanical induction with a balloon is probably as effective induction as vaginal PG to J. Now let us see, because these are the days of prostaglandins. How good is this old method in comparison to modern methods, other prostaglandins? How good is this actor now in comparison with these new day or modern day or current day actors? And let us see what data says. Cochrane data. A balloon catheter may be slightly less effective than oral and vaginal blizzoprostol. Okay. But again, the balloon seems to have more favorable safety profile. Therefore, the thinking of quite a few obstetricians, and this is what I'm asked when I go all over the country. Some of them have asked me that, sir, we use it because it seems to be more safe to us than a very active prostaglandin. It seems they are right. So what does the message tell us? Polyus catheter is useful, but we need oxytocin aug augmentation after the balloon is expelled. Polyus catheter is less effective than prostaglandins, but with better safety profile. So if you are using follies, you can continue to use. You have not become obsolete. I am asked this question so often, all over, because they know that I am doing lots of Dopplers and lots of work in this area. And the question asked to me is, sir, you teach a lot about Doppler, but we don't do Doppler. Are we really at a disadvantage? Is it so critical? For me, rather than my preference, more important is seeing the data. Let us see the data. Not very old, but keep space. 19 trial, trials. What makes it robust is 19 trials involving 10,667 women were included and the evidence suggested that the use of Doppler ultrasound on umbilical artery in high risk pregnancies reduces the risk of perinatal deaths and may result in fewer obstetric interventions. Now, this should make you confident. If you are not doing Dopplers, but have sonography machines with a facility, start doing it. And if you are not doing it, no imaging, sending it for reference, fine, request your sonologist to do a Doppler in, for obstetric decision making. However, there is a small side effect to this. And you people, some of you, may tend to start jumping. 
Then you see some features like this. See this picture. Actually, this is an early pregnancy. And you see vascularity, you start thinking always in terms of, in terms of very rare, means not, not very rare, but very scary situation. Sir, is this a molar pregnancy? No. This is a routine finding, especially post abort. Don't start jumping. Just find out the limitations and the normal C's in Doppler. And that you do by attending such sessions and by continuously reading and watching videos. Everyone wants to relax. And many times, though obstetrician is not relaxed, she or he wants the uterus to relax. And that brings us in tocolysis. Any new, anything new, anything in the light of current scientific evidence? In days, I remember, in days when isoxaprine was introduced for tocolysis, obstetricians used to use it for weeks together, weeks together for preventing premature uterine activity and in expectation of a pre of prevention of a preterm birth. Then came in studies which showed that tocolysis in general can prevent preterm labor for at best 48 hours, that's all. So if you are giving for weeks on end, how good was your decision? Now the situation is even larger. With so many tocolytics going on and off the table, our search for aids for arresting preterm labor continues. You would surely like to know, in the light of latest evidence, where does the matter stand now? A 2022 study, very recent. This network meta-analysis included 122 trials, a humongous 13,697 women. They studied six tocolytic classes, combinations, and compared with placebo or no treatment. And what did they find? And what first, let me tell you what they compared. They compared tocolytic drug classes, beta mimetics, calcium channel blockers, magnesium sulfate, oxytocin receptor antagonist, nitric oxide donors. So nearly the entire table has been covered. And their combinations. And they found that these were effective in delaying preterm birth for 48 hours to a maximum seven days. Now, this is very critical for us. When we are buying time for the steroids to act, antenatal corticosteroid, for enhancing lung maturity and many other advantages in a baby which is likely, which has decided to come early. So, this will be the extent to which you will be helped. Not beyond, not less. But there is one more agent which has come up, which is not compared here, but is also having lots of robust data to back up, and which can be used and is being used for a prolonged period of time. And that is progesterone. Practitioners throughout the country are asking for evidence showing if it is effective or otherwise. What do you feel? Keep thinking. There is a clear answers emerging. There was a time, I remember, when once at Rajasthan State Conference, I, decades ago, I had taken a stand that progesterones don't help. Now, I may have to change or I have changed that, that thinking. That is the difference between a scientist on one side and politicians and religious uh, preachers on the other. Religious preachers and politicians never accept that their thinking was wrong. They were not wrong, their thinking was wrong. Whereas scientists are ready to change and that for these such sessions become valuable. 2018 issue. Clear evidence of benefit with progesterone. Clear, unambiguous. 
Four systematic reviews reported clear evidence of benefit to prevent pregnant women from giving birth early. Pregnant women less than 37 weeks of gestation and without signs of labor, bleeding or infection. It, they were successful in preventing. But as a student of science, I would always like to go into depth of it. Okay, it prevents labor, fine. Prevents preterm labor, fine. Does it affect the newborn which is going to come? What does evidence show? This is a little older study, but still a very robust study because it studies 8,523 subjects who were considered to be increased risk of preterm labor. 12,515 infants found that where a progesterone was given in 8,523 women, there might be more pregnancies and therefore it was found that when this they were given progesterone to the infants, uh, sorry, to the mothers. The, the newborn which were born had actually beneficial effects, including reducing the risk of dying after birth, suffering complications such as requiring assisted ventilation, necrotizing enterocolitis, or requiring admission to neonatal intensive care units prolonging the pregnancy and reducing the chance of neonatal intensive care admissions. So progesterone seems to be a blessing. It helps and helps not only the mother in from going in for preterm labor, also the newborn, it helps from outside its, its body in the mother. Now, which progesterone, you will ask? With so many progesterone, hardly matters. And that is where we will refer to a protocol which our organization, yours and mine, has recommended. This is for recurrent miscarriage. You can apply it even for later, later on for preterm births. Prevention of preterm births. For oral route, they have recommended Dihydrogesterone 10 mg twice a day till 20 weeks of pregnancy. And vaginal root micronized progesterone 400 mg per day vaginally till 20 weeks of pregnancy. Most important, progesterone helps. Whatever scientific dose you give, this recommendation is just one of the different doses schedules which have been found effective. We come to the next situation. And that is, we had, and we all of us have had consultants when we were residents like this, very angry, always very angry. One consultant of anesthesia was a great nuisance during our residency. If she read before the OBGYN consultant, she would fire. Why am I made to wait? If the OBGYN consultant read before her, again she would fire. Why am I late? Once I heard she was blasting her residence at full volume in the OT when we had sent her a call for cesarean section and I was in the adjoining room, because I was not supposed to do the surgery or whatever, and I had to attend other patients. When this was, this shouting was going on, I went inside and saw that she was now cross with her residents because they had not started nasal oxygen in the mother after inducing spinal anesthesia. You will bring out the baby asphyxiated as some amount of blood pressure always falls. I countered her because I had, I was a senior resident and I was by and large fearless. So I told her, no ma'am, it doesn't matter. 
this cesarean section is for CPD and the fetus is inside is not asphyxiated. How right was I? How right was she? It is not trying to prove the boss wrong. No, never. We are their students. But evidence is the teacher of all. And let us see what happened. Overall, the author's conclusion was, overall, we found no convincing evidence that giving supplementary oxygen to healthy term pregnant women during caesarean section under regional anesthesia is either beneficial or harmful for either the mother or the fetus as assessed by Abgar's course. So insistence and biased uh, stands that you must give or you must not give are both wrong. If they have not given, they did not deserve a firing. I mean the res junior residents. Having had seen the pre-labor section, we now come to labor monitoring and management. Onion had had seizures. Parents script that had better labor monitoring been done, this would not have happened. The hospital protocol committee sat down to review if continuous intrapartum monitoring should be done as a routine in labor management protocols. Keep thinking, what stand would you take? Because the disaster review committee has always come out with some very good suggestions. And they also require data. And what the data they have fallen back upon? CTG during labor is associated with reduced, surely reduced rates of neonatal seizures. But, 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 there is no clear differences in cerebral palsy, infant mortality, or other standard measures of neonatal well-being. However, continuous CTG was surely associated with an increase in caesarean sections and instrumental vaginal birth. So now you select what stand you want to do, take. While on seizures, we come to one more very painful aspect, and that is cerebral palsy. No obstetrician would like to see a baby born in, in her care to be having cerebral palsy. Recently, I was shown a child with a cerebral palsy. It delivered in some other city, and it was an uneventful one delivery with no operative intervention and a favorable Abgar score at birth. Parents pointedly asked me, Sir, are there measures to prevent this now that science has advanced so much? I went to data to open up the key, open up the lock. And let me see what the data key showed me. 2017 study shows a Cochrane systematic review. 15 Cochrane reviews. They included 279 RCTs. Data for cerebral pulses were available from RCTs including 32,490 children. It's robust data. There was surely a reduction in cerebral palsy in children born to women at risk of preterm births who received magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection of the fetus compared with placebo. Friends, there are many other aspects to this study I went through two, three times and then have filtered these things out where we can be helped. And this is one facility or this is one advance in science, though not very recent, which can help us. In preterm births, babies who were given magnesium sulfate, not for preventing preterm birth, that apart, but for actually preventing cerebral palsy. And this usually is given, there are many dosage schedules, but usually given in a loading dose of 4 grams, administered slowly over 20 to 30 minutes IV, followed by a titrated dose of 1 gram per hour as a maintenance uh, dose. This regimen should continue until birth, but should be stopped after 24 hours if the 
baby is not delivered. So max 24 hours. There is one more aspect to this. Low quality evidence found that there was a possible reduction in cerebral palsy for children born to women at risk of preterm birth who received antenatal corticosteroids. We have just discussed antenatal corticosteroids. Who received antenatal corticosteroids for accelerating fetal lung maturation compared with placebo. So, this drug, I remember when the new millennium started, one of the options one of the obstetric journals, very renowned journal, came out with an editor and it said that if this editor has to identify one drug of the last millennium, which, has, which is the drug of the millennium, it would be antenatal corticosteroids. Rightly so. This drug has really helped the babies, newborns and the mothers, millions of them throughout the world. So it is a very much neither very much rational drug, not overrated. And why on overrating? Some people believe that she is an overrated actor. I don't go into controversy. But somebody was recently discussing with me, so therefore, I brought the slide. But here I am bringing something which makes many of us ask whether partograms are overrated or their use in protocols. Most labor management protocols include partogram and as a necessary and important inclusion. It is time to review its influence and importance. 2018 study, 11 studies, 9,475 women reviewed. There is no clear difference between partograph, use or no, or no, no use in maternal outcome. There is no clear difference even in the neonatal outcome. Therefore, the message is loud and clear. Partograms are not much useful. If you are not using, leave it. They might be useful for asking questions in MD exams, that's all. Labor over, any developments in postpartum management. And here comes something where our practice is good or bad. I will tell you what. In second stage of labor or following vaginal hysterectomy because you are an OBGYN, during vaginal hysterectomy, when a lithotomy position is given, patient passes to often, not, not rare, quite commonly. How alarming is this? Because we always start jumping. We are very much worried about infection. Understanding. Let us see whether how much right is our fear or how much misplaced is it. And some recent important information has come on this. A 2023 study has shown that this does not increase the risk of episiotomy or perineal tear or perineal repair surgeries which we do when patient has passed tool because thorough cleaning is immediately done by the OBGYNs and that probably prevents in a already sterile atmosphere, thorough cleaning is done and then sutures are taken. So be rest assured, continue doing what you are doing and clean it up properly and don't, your stitches are not at an increased risk. And this will fascinate you. What is she doing here? Well, it, this process has a memory for me of my residency days, decades ago. As a resident, I always toyed with the idea of making a woman chew gum, which will increase the salivary activity and swallowing for ensuring early intestinal movement recovery. However, ours were the days where 
early ambulation was becoming more popular at that time. And so the gun, gum remained untested. I, I asked it with my, my colleagues and discussed with my junior residents as well as senior because I was mid-level at that time. They all laughed it out. Now you think whether chewing gum helps this purpose, whether this can be help, helpful. A little a older study, seven years, 17 randomized controlled trials, 3,149 participants, not controlled randomized trials, 3,149 participants. Primary outcome of this review showed that for the women that chewed gum, the time of passage of first platus was seven hours shorter than those women in the usual care group. The rate of ileus was on average 60% lower in the chewing gum group compared to the controls. Tolerance to gum chewing appeared to be high. The time of passage of feces occurred on an average nine hours earlier than the non-intervention group. So the message is loud and clear. Chewing gum will help recovering intestinal activity faster after LSCS. So friends, labor room has many wonderful old established monumental decisions taken. There is always a need to revisit them, check if they are still valid or they have lost the sheen. And only thing which can help in this is data. Data I am a big fan of because it shows science. It is not I thought so or you thought so, or he or she thought so. No, data, solid data. And for this, having a quality data, we have to be very well alert of what is going around and what is getting published. That will give us a sense of being under control. And for that, we have to be also well informed and well read besides attending such sessions. And this will help you to handle your labor room and your decision making with a dance. I'm really thankful to all of you for this full house session. And I will be ending with a small dance message so that you can dance on the basis of science after you have done rational decision making.
of use to you to whatever knowledge i can gather and garner and give it and share it with you thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you very much